live from San Jose, it's theCUBE. Presenting Big Data Silicon Valley. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to theCUBE. We are live in San Jose at our event, Big Data SV. I'm Lisa Martin, and we are down the street from the Strata Data Conference. We've had a great day so far talking with a lot of folks from different companies that are all involved in the big data unraveling process. I'm excited to welcome back to theCUBE one of our distinguished alumna, Maribel Lopez, the founder and principal analyst at Lopez Research. Welcome back to theCUBE. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so you've been up, uh, started a conference started a couple days ago. What are some of the trends and, and things that you're hearing that are really kind of top of mind for not just the, the customers that are attending, but the companies that are creating uh, or trying to create solutions around this big data? Um, challenge and opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we talked a lot about data in the years past. How do you gather the data? How do you store the data? How you might want to process the data? This year seems to be all about how do I make something interesting happen with the data? How do I make an intelligent insight? How do I cure prostate cancer? How do I make sure I can classify images? It's a really different show and we've also changed some of the terminology. A lot more on machine learning now and artificial intelligence and frankly, a lot of discussion around ethics. So it's been very data interesting. Data ethics, you mean? Data ethics, how do we do privacy? How do we maintain the, um, the right level of data so that we don't have bias in our data? How do we get diversity inclusion going? Lots of really interesting, powerful human topics, not just about the data. I love that, the human topics, especially where you know AI and ML come into play. Right. You, you talked about data diversity, um, or bias in there. We were just at the Women in Data Science conference a couple days ago mm -hmm. talking to a lot of female leaders in, in data science, computer science, both in academia as well as in industry. And mm -hmm. one of the interesting topics about the gender disparity is the fact that that is limiting the analyses on data in terms of there may be a few perspectives looking at mm -hmm. it, so there's inherent bias there. So that's one issue, and I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Another is, with, with that thought, lack of thought diversity, I guess I would say, going into analyzing the data, companies might be potentially limiting themselves on right. the types of products that they can create, how to monetize the data, and actually drive new revenue streams. On the kind of thought diversity, we'll start there. What are some of the things that you're hearing, um, and what are your, some of your recommendations for your clients on how to get some of that bias out of data analysis. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, one is trying to find multiple sources of data. So there's data that you have and that you own, but there's a wide range of openly available data now. Uh, there's some challenges around making sure that that data is clean before you integrate it with your data, but basically diversifying your data sources with third party data is one big thing that we're talking about. Um, in previous analytical generations, I think we talked a lot about you had to have a hypothesis and you were trying to prove a hypothesis, and now I think we're trying to be a little more open and looser and not really lead the data anywhere right. per yes. se, but try to find the right patterns and correlations in the data. And then just awareness in general, like we don't, believe we're biased, but if we have data that's biased and it gets put into the system, so we have to really be thoughtful about what we put into the system. So I think that those three things combined have really changed the way people are looking at it. And there's a lot of awareness now around that because we assume at some point the machines might be making certain decisions for us and we want to make sure that they have the best information to do that and that they don't limit our opportunities as a society. How, where are companies in terms of the clients that you see culturally in terms of embracing the openness. Because you're right, from a scientific mm -hmm. scientific method perspective, people go into, I'm, I'm going to hypothesize this because I think I'm going to find this. Yes. And maybe wanting the data to say this. Where are companies, we'll say enterprises, in becoming culturally more open to mm -hmm. not leading the data somewhere and bringing that bias in? Well, there are two interesting things here, right? I think there's, um, People that have gone down the data route for a while now, sort of the industry leading companies, they're in this mindset now of trying to make sure they don't lead the data, they don't create biases in the data, uh, they have um, ways to explain how the data and the analysis and the learning came about, not just for regulation, but so that they can make sure they've ethically done the right thing. But then I think there's the other 95% of companies that they're not even yet, there yet. They don't know that this is a problem yet. So 
they're still dealing with the, I've got to pull in the data, I've got to do something with it. They don't even know what they want to do with it, let alone if it's biased or not. So we're not quite at the leading the witness point there with a lot of organizations. But, but that's something that you expect to see maybe down the road. I, I'm hoping we'll get ahead of it. I'm really hoping that we'll get ahead it's of it. It's a good positive outlook and on it, yeah. I think that, um, I think because the real analysis of the data problem in a big machine learning, deep learning way is so new, and that people are actually out seeking guidance, that there's an opportunity to get ahead of it. The second thing that's happening is people don't have data scientists, right? So they don't necessarily have the people that can code this. So what they're doing now is they're depending on the vendor landscape to provide them with an entry level set of tools. So if you're Microsoft, if you're Google, if uh, you're Amazon, you're trying very hard to make sure that you're giving tools that have the right ethics in them and that can help kickstart people's machine learning efforts. So I think that's going to be a real win for us. And we talked a lot today at the Strata conference about how, oh, you don't have enough images, you can't do that, or oh, you don't have enough um, data, you can't do that, or you don't have enough data scientists. And some of what came back is that some of the best and the brightest have coded some things that you can start to use to kickstart that will get you to a better place than you ever could have started with yourself. So that was pretty exciting, you know, uh, uh, transfer learning as an example of taking, you know, ImageNet from Google and some algorithms and using those to take your images and try to figure out if somebody has Alzheimer's or not and code things that Alzheimer's or not characteristics. So very cool stuff, very exciting and nice to see that we've got some minds working on this for us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Where you're meeting with clients that don't have a data scientist or a chief analytics officer, mm -hmm. sounds like the tech, a lot of the technologies need to or some have built in sort of enablement for mm -hmm. a different um, data citizen within a company. If you're talking to clients that don't have a data scientist or data science team, who are your constituents there? Where are companies that don't, that maybe have that skill gap where, yeah. Who do they go to in their organization to start evaluating the data that they have to get to know it and start to understand what their potential is? Yeah, there's a couple places people go. They, they go to their um, business decision uh, analytics people. So the people that were working with their uh, BI dashboards, for example. Uh, the second place I go is to the cloud computing guys because they're hearing a lot about cloud computing and maybe I could buy some of this stuff in the cloud. I'm just going to roll up and get all my machine learning in the cloud, right? So we're not there yet. So the, the biggest thing that I talk to people about right now is what are the realities around machine learning and AI? Um, we have made tremendous progress, but you know, you read the newspaper and um, something's going to get rid of your job and AIs are going to take over the world and we're kind of far from that reality. First of all, it's very dystopian and negative, but even if it weren't that, you know, what you can do today is not that. So there's a lot of stages in between. So the first thing is just trying to get people comfortable with no, you can't just buy one product and throw in some data and you've got everything you need, right? We're not there yet, but we're getting closer. You can add some components, you can get some new information, you can do some new correlations. So just getting a reality and grounding of where we are and that we have a lot of opportunity and that it's moving very fast. That's the other thing. Right. IT leaders are used to, I'll evaluate it once a year, I'll evaluate it once every couple of years. These things are moving in monthly increments, like really huge changes in product categories. So you kind of have to keep on top of it to make sure you know what's available to you. Right, and if they don't, they miss out on not only the ability to monetize data streams, but yeah. potentially going out of business. Because yeah. somebody will come in maybe more nimble and agile and be able to do it faster. Yeah, and we already saw this with um, the digital native companies that started, born in the cloud companies, we used mm -hmm. to call them. Well now everybody can be using the cloud. So the question then is like, what's the next wave of that? And the next wave of that is around understanding how to use your data, understanding how to get third party data in, and being able to rapidly make decisions and change models based on that. One of the things that's interesting about big data is, you know, it was a, it was a big buzzword and it seems to be becoming less of a buzzword now. I mean, Gartner even was saying, I think the number yeah. was, 85% of big data projects, and I think that's more um, in test dev environments, fail. And I mm. often say failure, in a lot of cases, is not a bad F word because it spawns genesis of new products, new ideas, et cetera. But yeah. when you're talking with clients who go, all right, we've embraced, we've, we've embraced Hadoop, We've got this big data lake, now it's turning really swampy. We don't <laughs> we've know got lakes, We've got oceans, we've got ponds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What's the conversation there where you're helping a customer clean that swamp up, get broader visibility across their data sets and enable different lines of business, not just 
you know, the BI folks or the cloud folks or IT, but marketing, logistics, sales, what's that conversation like to, to um, clean up the swamp and, and do more enablement for visibility? I, I think one of the things that we got really hung up on was you know, creating a data ocean. Right. We're going to bring everything all into one place, it's going to be this one massive Sounded data store, great. it's going to be awesome, and that's just not the reality of the world, right? So I think the first thing in the cleaning up that we have to do is being able to figure out what's the source of truth for any given data set that somebody needs. So you see 15 salespeople walk in and they all have different versions of the data, that shouldn't happen. Right. right? So we need to get to the point where they know where the source of truth is for that data. Um, the second is sort of governance around the data. We spend a lot of time dumping the data, but not a lot of time in terms of getting governance around who can access it, what they can do with it, for how long they could have access to it. Is it just internal, is it internal and external? So I think that's the second thing around like um, harassing and haranguing the swamps and the lakes and the ponds, right? Um, and then assuming that you do that, I think the other thing is, um, there, you know, if, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> Well, in reality, you know, when you construct things, you have nails, you have screws, you have bolts, right? And picking the right tool for the job is something that the IT leadership has to work with, and the only way that they get that right is to work very closely with the different lines of business so they can understand the problem, because the business unit leader knows the problem, they don't know the solution. If you put them together, which we've talked about forever, frankly, but now I think we're seeing um, more imperatives for those two to work closely together, and sometimes it's even driven by security, just to make sure that the data isn't leaking into other places, or that it's secure and that they've met regulatory compliance. So we're in a much better space than we were two, three, five years ago, because we're thinking about the real problems now, not just how do you collect it, and how do you store it, but how do we actually make it an actionable, manageable set of solutions? Exactly, and make it work for the business. Well, Maryville, yes. I wish we had more time, but thank you, you so thank much you. for stopping by theCUBE, sharing the insights that mm -hmm. you've seen, um, not just at Strata Conference, but also with your clients. Thank you. We want to thank you for watching theCUBE. Again, I'm Lisa Martin, live from Big Data SV in downtown San Jose. Get involved in the conversation, hashtag Big Data SV. Come see us at the Forager Eatery and Tasting Room, and I'll be right back with our next guest. <laughs>